So good evening. Today we have another more or less shorter video and I just wanted to point something out because I watched a video where one fellow was trying to get his old Fleischmann locomotive to work and he had an issue that the that he experienced shortening while the engine was running on the track. And uh, in order to fully understand this of what's going on with this stuff here is um, that applies mostly to the old die cast models. And you can see this, I have the old E44 already taken apart. This one will be converted to the uh, DCC with a lock pilot five. But in order to get into the details, I wanted to show you this. As I had mentioned before, is the most uh, common issue you have with these old uh, die-cast models from, from Fleischmann is that they all have a very high center of gravity. You can see this, how easily the locomotive will fall over. And Fleischmann in those days had a, quite some weight to this. I would say they weigh at least 16 ounces or better. And usually what happens is they fall off the track in a curve at a higher speed. And that will create some damage, especially when the engine hits the floor. On this one here, this there's a long story to this and I will tell that story. I got this one here from South Africa from a fellow named Angus. He got this locomotive, he thought in 1953, but he, model checks out this particular version here to be a 1955 or 56 uh, unit which is basically two years into the manufacture of this and the first indication i had with angus that he ran into a problem when he was younger is by looking at the uh, buffer and we can see let me zoom back in first here and now I should be able, hopefully, to zoom in fully. Let me see, we can, yeah, now we can see it. Bring the slide over. We can see the buffer is actually broke. It broke up. You can see there's half of the, this missing. The buffer should look like this here. So the first thing is on a on a on an engine with shorts, if it is a die cast, you have to inspect the engine itself for damage. See, this is a, a functioning buffer. This buffer here was mounted on the right hand side of the track. Here on this side, let me zoom back out. You can see this better back here. That means this is the front. This was the uh, track which picks up the power. And he was going in this direction and the engine fell out. And now if we look, we have to really, really carefully look in this here. It is very hard to see when we're trying to zoom in, but the die cast frame is fractured here, right above the window. And here we can see the crack on the other side. I know that's probably difficult to see in the video. Let me see if I can zoom in and out. I'm trying to display this right here. Let me see if we can get the light a little bit better on here. Here we can see it. That is that uh, lighter area which is cracked. The other thing is what we also can see is you can see that the window frame here is straight. It's a straight line. When you turn it around, you can see it actually bowed out. It is bowed in this direction. So the engine fell off the track going in this direction around and it fell out and it landed on a hard floor with the buffer, with this broken buffer here on the right hand side. And then what happened is that bent because the buffer is mounted here, that got this entire track out of whack. And the uh, the carriage of this where the wheels sit on is this here. 
And what will happen is if this is not absolutely parallel to each other, then the wheels, when, they, when you go in a curve, they're starting to touch the body. And this goes back to our color scheme with the blue and the black wire. On, on this very old engine, everything in here is black wires. They didn't use any blue wires at all. It's all black. But on this one here, like I said, is on all the Fleischmann engines, you always start out with the gear side. This is the grounded to chassis side. This is the conducting wheel, which will always conduct on the motor side. And this means that this side here, these wheels here have to be the non-insulated or if they're insulated, they have to have a contact on here, which ties this together with the frame basically. So this and this is on the same potential. And then this here is the blue wire and this side is the blue wire. And here on this one as well as what Fleischmann then did in the later years, like this is the 62 one, is they made the the truck or the, the carriage, actually the wheel carriage, the boogie, 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 uh, swivel. And if the wheels and this thing is bent uh, because of a fall, then the wheels will start making a short, usually the blue wire side to the truck itself. And I had it on this one here. And on this one, we can see this even better. As you can see this, this is a typical Fleischmann wheel where the um, this side here is non-insulated and this is the insulated wheel. And what happened here is that the person put them together opposite. This was another issue. So what happens now is that the insulated wheel and this insulated wheel here meet up with the non-insulated. If you get them swapped like this here, then the right track will make contact with the left track through the body of the boogie, the bogey. And so you always have to check this. The other thing is on most multimeters like this one here, I have just for reference, most of you will know this, is that the um, when you go into continuity test, anything which is less than 30 ohms usually is shown as continuity. So if I take the motor and I test this here, we should hear this, we will have continuity. But when we measure the resistance, actually, we will find out this is actually 30, 40 ohms, actually. So this, my meter actually looks at everything 50 ohms or so below as continuity. What we're looking for in continuity when we're testing the wheels out is basically anything less than one ohm. To, to be correct. Otherwise, we might be measuring the motor, as you just saw, and we get a false reading. We think we have continuity where we don't have any. Um, that is unfortunately something which can happen uh, and has happened. On the other unit here on the blue one, I wanted to show you this too. This is the, this is done later in the 60s. In the 60s, they made both sides swivel basically in both directions. You can see this. And this was supposed to be allowing the engine with the higher center of gravity to stay longer in the track and not as easily fall over. On this one here, we have a, a bent frame. As you can see it, the frame goes up this way. It's bowed from the crash. And we have a, I think, I have actually replaced this one already. This one had a broken buffer too. Usually they land on the buffer and the coupler usually breaks when that happens. And here we had the problem is that I had to replace the this carriage here, the or the boogie or the truck with the plastic one because it had fractured on both sides diagonal when it actually hit the ground. And on a other one I got 
we can see the damage is even worse. This one is also bowed. The entire carriage is bowed this way. They tend to bow from the shock. And we can see that the rear four set of wheels, the smaller ones are missing. So this is a 434 four, and the last set of four is missing. And we can see really here on how badly this thing actually broke apart right here. If you wanna zoom in, this is quite visible. And this is this engine is so bad this has been so bad that the gears actually are pushing against it because the the body, the the engine body, has also bowed in this direction. Let me just zoom out again. In this direction. So this is really the first inspection you have to do. And then you want to make sure that when you have the now let me say this, the cast iron or die cast chassis are very, very difficult to straighten out because they will eventually break. And what I do is in, in very, very careful motions is, first of all, I measure this out. You can do this either in metric or in, and I'm, just, I'm looking here where the axles are gonna be of what my distance is on both sides if they're very close or if they are far off. And they should be ideally the same. So we got 24 millimeters here and we got 23.85. So this is still narrower here than it is on this side here. And then you have to measure diagonal that you make sure that the thing actually is still square because sometimes they go and they bend diagonally and then they also twist in. So that means that this part on top here is narrower than the one on the bottom. And this was the case on this one here for the E44 from his fall. And what I do is I just give this a very, very light, you can see this pushing. This is about the most you can do with this without breaking them. And then the best thing is to put them in the oven at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. This is 150 degree Fahrenheit. You have to convert this over to Celsius. It's not very hot. It's probably about 60 degrees or so, 75 degrees Celsius. You don't want to get much hotter. And I let them sit in there for about an hour at that temperature to relieve the stresses. We can still see that the whole carriage, if we carefully look, I don't know if this is gonna come out in the video or not. Let me zoom in here. If we can see this, we can still see there's a still a light bow towards the center in there. And that will be a problem for the, um, Uh, with the wheels. The wheels are going to touch this here. And this is especially the blue one, which is the insulated track from the chassis, which is going to make then contact with this here and through the track carriage goes to the other side of the track. So that is usually the chore that is most of the shorts what you experience with these older locomotives. I test all of them. That's why I did this when I overhaul them the way I do. This is the uh, V200 you saw in the uh, video, in that little short video. This is number two. And this one is the one which is going to get the lock sound later on when we get to it. Um, on, on the V200s, one of the things is that this here is movable. You can see this, this moves here. This is only in here with three pins and one pin has a clip, a circlip ring on it. And that is not very stable. What I winded up doing in the other one is to use a JB weld and I welded this in. But before you do the JB weld, make sure that the windows are inserted correctly. You may want to use a little bit of glue and glue them to the chassis. Uh, because then they have two slots in here and here in this part, which hold that window in position. And if you do this first, uh, if you glue this in without the window in place, then the that plastic strip will not fit into the slots. And um, I'm terrible with painting stuff, so I have to find a way on how to restore the lettering a little bit. But otherwise, I think she looks pretty acceptable for the age of this. You can see there's some small blemishes here. 
but this is to be expected. This is like the patina, patina, but she came out real clean, you know. Um, so this is the one for the lock pilot. Yeah, but this is basically where the short business is coming from. And like I said, this, I will be fully documenting the conversion of this one here. We, you see, we have to clean her up. She needs a lot of cleaning and some adjusting. And I will explain to you on how you can determine on these Fleischmann locks on how old they are. Um, one note is I had said on the other V200 that this was the original motor. This is actually the motor of all motors, which has the Pertinax cover on one side and uh, this type of a plate on the other side. Pertinax here and, and this was then changed. They made that plate a triangular shape like you saw on the V200, um, you know, uh, conversion over to DCC. But this one here has the advantages that they left uh, connector or pole for the anchor for the motor is not tied to ground until you actually put the screw in which means that we can we can put an insulator under the screw and then this pole is floating the same way as this one is and they had uh, the old style you can see this how worn out this is this is actually one of the real old ones and that is where they had contact points in the uh in the pickup, which goes against the wheels, and you can see there's one missing here. The contact point fell out. This came from the telecommunication people back in the 50s. They had a tool to basically put new contact points on there. You would clean it, but I have to replace this and uh, put a new contact on here. This is how old this is. This is original. And uh, like I said, this in the other video, I will explain or show on how you determine this. And our Chinese friend, they made these great lights, which work really well. But unfortunately, they didn't put enough weight on the bottom here to hold them up. And the magnet is even weaker to hold it in the car because I bought them primarily to work on my car. And uh, they have worked out so and so in this here. But this is what's coming. So this will be a separate video. With that, you have a great evening.